Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, I'd like to welcome you again, all of you, to Political Science 303. Uh, today is the fourth time we're meeting, or the fifth time, I, I forgot. So, so, um, so this morning, we will be continuing with our discussion on um, democracy and democratization. Uh, last time, you will remember, I hope you do remember, that we've covered um, some definitional aspects, some conceptual aspects of democracy. You know, what democracy was, how did it evolve. Um, then we talked about democratization, process of democratization, um, and the three waves associated with the process of democratization, starting from by about the mid 19th century, ending by about the turn of the 21st century. Um, then we did a quick introduction to the distinction between procedural approach to democracy on the one hand, and the other one was, come on guys, outcomes, very good. So, so um, I'd like to emphasize this um, here at this point in time, in the course of the, you know, course, in the sense that scholars conceptualize democracy in two ways. One, one group of scholars conceptualize democracy as a set of procedures, which are basically rules, okay? Rules of the game, like institutions. Okay, institutionalized, stable, regular, knowable, therefore predictable rules. Okay? As long as these rules exist, we do a checkbox, we tick every box, and as long as all of these, and at the same time, so they coexist at the same time. So procedure number one, and procedure number two, and procedure number three, and procedure number four. It's never procedure number two or procedure number three. No. All of these should exist, coexist at the same time. Okay? So, so um, one set of scholars conceptualize democracy as a set of procedures. The other scholars um, conceptualize democracy in terms of the outcomes of the political system. We call these systems democratic, these guys argue, as long as this political system produces fairness. This, produ uh, this political system leads to equality. This political system e leads to or results in justice. Okay, as long as these are, uh, these are all present, these outcomes are ensured, guaranteed, we do not really care about whether those procedures exist or not. We just don't care, these scholars argue. It is, as you can imagine, way much easier to conceptualize, operationalize, and measure procedures as opposed to outcomes. Therefore, most mainstream political scientists think in terms of the procedures. Okay? Therefore, in comparative politics, in, in that respect, we generally look for whether these procedures exist. And we build um, all kinds of uh, databases based on those procedures, whether those procedures exist. Okay? Um, so um, so we'll, we'll continue with the procedural approach We'll look at component procedures based on Schmitter and Carl's discussion in their um, seminal article, which was um, written, which was published in 1991, uh, tight with the title What Democracy Is and Is Not. Um, then we'll talk about briefly about qualifiers of these procedures and what we call those regimes. Um, some with some deficient elements, with some deficient procedures, what, whatever we call those regimes. Um, and then we'll finally talk about um, um, different models of democracy, you know, uh, not conceptions, but different models of existing democracy. Okay, um, let's continue like this. 
uh, we've covered all this. And we were, we just were starting off with uh, Schmidt and Carl's procedural approach. That is to say, the rules and arrangements that need to exist, in fact, that need to coexist if we want our democracy to be stable, we want our democracy to endure, OK? And these procedures are several. In fact, there are seven of these that I wish to highlight here. Um, Schmidt and Karl very famously define democracy as a modern, well, they say modern political democracy is a system of governance, is a system of governance in which rulers are held accountable for their actions in the public realm by citizens. So rulers are held accountable for their actions by citizens in the public realm. And these citizens are acting indirectly through competition as well as cooperation of their elected representatives. So, so the rules, the procedures, the arrangements i.e. procedures here. Start with the system of governance. What do we mean or what do they mean by system of governance? When they refer to system of governance, they refer to actually an institutionalized regime of governance which represents an ensemble, a collectivity of stable patterns determining methods of access to public office. So stable patterns, institutionalized regimes, institutionalized systems, which determine how one gets to be elected for public office. They call this system, or they represent, they, they, they present this system as an institutionalized regime. By institutionalization, they mean patterns which are habitually known, which are practiced over and over again, regularly practiced, that is and which are accepted by majorities, by most of the people living in that regime, living under that regime, living in that country. OK? So, so this is a certain type of system of governance. OK? That's, that's procedure number one. Procedure number two, rulers. What kind of rulers? Yes, there are rulers. There have always been rulers, as long as there was one form of state or one form of hierarchy, there were rulers. But in this uh, certain specific type of governance, the rulers are held accountable. They come to power by democratic norms. They come to power through the workings, the operation of democratic norms. Okay, So rulers come to power. They enjoy and they continue to enjoy office in accordance with preset principles, i.e. democratic principles. And they are democratically held accountable. So they're not just accountable. They're held democratically accountable. Okay, So there are rules and procedures for them to be accountable for their actions. Okay, So there are norms, rules, that define how they will be held accountable. And these rules and norms are defined democratically. Okay? Um, a third procedure, public realm. Um, this pertains to the making, the policy making, or the norm making processes collective norm making, collective policy making, 
collective decision making and the public realm is basically the venue within which these <coughs> norms are made, produced and reproduced. These decisions are made, produced and reproduced. Okay? So all decisions that are binding in society, all of these norms, all of these decisions that are binding on society are all made within the public realm. Okay? It's a vague, abstract concept, but keep that in mind. It is one of the procedures that has to exist. It is one of the elements of what makes a democracy. And, and all of these collective norm making, there are rules for, for making these collective processes, and they're all backed by state sanctions. So they're institutionally backed by the state through different sanctions. By institutions, I mean the state here defines and enforces these procedures in the public realm. Another aspect of modern political democracy, another element, another procedure of modern political democracy is citizens. An essential component here, an essential element, an essential in that respect, uh, one of the rules, key rules of the game. Um, by citizens we mean by all native born adults who are eligible to participate in collective decision making in the public realm and who in turn may be voted for office and therefore become a ruler in this system of governance. Okay? And um, all native born adults, of course there are age limits for participating in elections, but there are no age limits to act as citizens in um, civil society organizations in, or participating in social movements, right? So, so um, all native born adults, sometimes the native born term becomes problematic because there is the element of or there are people who are not necessarily native born who have migrated to our system of governance, huh? who may be nationalized or naturalized, who become citizens and who thus enjoy political as well as so social and economic rights. Okay? So it doesn't have to be all native born adults. Okay, please. So what about the case? Uh the, the citizens do not put their own uh, expectations from the ruler, for example. What, if, it, what happens if the citizens do not abide by the rules? In that case, there are state sanctions in the public realm because these collective decisions are made in the first place. If a citizen is not abiding by the norms, and the decisions and the rules which have previously been collectively made and you know in a legitimate and democratic way then of course there will be some sanctions backed by the state I'm saying this because of the cross that the, uh, you know the peace treaty between Colombia and the FARC there was no actually uh, has been rejected has been mhm mm mhm mm The referendum. The uh huh. To make decisions. What if there is apathy? What if there is apathy in the system, or what if? Well, um, 
this should be allowed in a democratic system. We'll talk about this in, in three minutes, but um, so, so, so this is, I mean, a precursor to um, institutions or procedures of competition and cooperation. Citizens may compete and cooperate with one another through established means, methods, beyond elections. So um, if you're the ruler, you're democratically elected for a term of office of, let's say, four years. You make a decision, then citizens should be able to object to that decision in the interim of those four years, within the duration of those four years. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, but, but just, just give me three more minutes, okay? So we'll talk about that in more detail, and we'll, I'll come back to this example. Just wait, just wait. But, but one, of the, one of the central procedures of democracy, yes, elections should exist, but, but other aspects, other elements, other procedures should be existing too. But, but before I continue with that, um, let me go back to the term citizen, um, the concept citizen. What used to be called citizens, of course, it was limited to white, male, wealthy. But in modern political democracies, this is no longer the case. So um, the number of citizens have been or has been expanding uh, within a populace, a population that come that that live under that and under a given political regime. So citizenship expands in time, through time, especially through the 20th century. Starts from the mid 19th century, or modern conceptions of citizenship expanded all throughout the 20th century. Um, now let me come back to, or come forward to other procedures. Um, one major element is competition. Schmitter and Karl call this element a necessary evil for democracy. It has to exist in a democracy. Um, this is contra to classic notions of democracy, uh, which were based on direct participation leading to consensus. So we do not seek consensus in a modern political democracy. Conflict is an essential um, structural component. Competition, conflict, these are all structural components of political regimes. Um, and in modern democracy, there is even competition within parties, political parties, not only among or between political parties, there is also competition within political parties. So um, by competition, we refer to first and foremost, of course, elections, right? Elections should exist. They are the sine qua non of democracy, without which democracy would not exist. Right? It's an essential principle, of, or the elections are essential principles, essential procedures, uh, set rules of the game, institutionalized rules, procedures within modern political systems. Um, elections should be fairly counted, well, I'm sorry, fairly conducted and honestly counted. Okay? So, the fact that elections exist is not enough. They should be fairly um, conducted. Every political party that, that goes into an election, they have to be playing on, a, uh, on, on an even level playing field. And um, they should be honestly counted. Okay, so, so this is this is one major um, element within democracy or a competition element uh, of democracy. Uh, Schmitter and Karl 
warn, make two warnings here. One of them is the fallacy of what they call electionism. The problem with elections is that Schmitter and Karl argue that elections allow citizens to choose between highly aggregated alternatives offered by different political parties. Therefore, they, they emphasize that elections or in elections, the running competing political parties offer packages. Package A by party Y, package B by party Z, package C by party V. We choose between different parties for different packages. So they argue that this agglomeration, this um, aggregation presents a problem because as a citizen, you may want to pick and choose between and among and within those alternatives. Uh, you may wish to you know, uh, cherry pick two items from the manifesto, the election manifesto of party A or policy package of party A, another two of party B, and still another one from party C's election manifesto. So, so we have to be very careful with the problem, the fallacy of electionism, Schmitter and Karl argue. Another um, fallacy of electionism is the existence of elections and nothing else. Sometimes the literature refers to fallacy of electionism in that respect. Elections exist, but no other um, principle or uh, rules of the game uh, or procedures exist in a political system. That's not enough, uh, Schmitter and Karl warn us. Um, another problem is, problem. it's called the problem of majority rule. Um, when numbers meet intensities, Schmitter and Karl emphasize, in the sense that when a stable and self-perpetuating majority regularly comes to power and makes decisions. Tyranny of majority, very good. So uh, when a majority comes to power again and again and again, then the problem of tyranny of majority, the potential problem of tyranny of majority may emerge. So Schmitter and Karl argue we have to be very careful with respect to this emerging problem of tyranny of majority. Please. Very good. Very good. So, um, so, so when, if and when we have tyranny of majority, some minority or some minorities may get affected adversely, okay? may get hurt, may get harmed. So um, majority rule, Schmitter and Karl emphasize, should be qualified through different other elements democratic elements, such as Bill of Rights, constitutional provisions, constitutional guarantees, civil rights and liberties, which are ingrained in the constitutions, uh, checks and balances, separation of powers, federalism, okay? More decentralized systems of policy making and, you know, uh, policy formulation. Um, and in addition to those, they also emphasize that neocorporatism may exist. We'll, we'll give examples of neocorporatist policy making, decision making when we talk about the German case, for example. Meaning that we have a state here, okay, in social policy making, for example. The state comes together with labor and capital and form a tripartite decision-making triangle and make decisions all together in, for example, determining the level of minimum wages. 
Okay, so so these elements should complement elections as a side guarantee to all these elements. These elements should exist. Uh, in addition to this, consociationalism. Anyone who's heard of the term consociationalism before? Consociationalism. Um, we'll talk about this when we discuss Leipart's models of democracy, but it's, it's, most, it's basically a consensus-based system with multiple layers and multiple actors okay, involved in norm-making, decision-making um, in the system of governance in the public realm, okay, which in turn make rulers accountable democratically. So, so all of these systems, all of these, I'm sorry, all of these uh, elements should be complementing elections. But we know that elections um, take place periodically um, under normal circumstances. Let's say we have elections in the year 2000, then we have elections in 2004, we have elections in 2008, we have elections in 2012 and 2016, okay? This is, let's say, for general elections every four years. Yes, the ruling political parties who come to office enjoy office in the interim. But within this, in this period, competition is not ending. Competition continues in other forms. Competition continues through interest associations, social movements, civil society organizations, and others. Therefore, accountability is not only taking place at these critical junctures. Accountability has to exist all throughout. Meaning, what I, what I want to emphasize here, uh, this is also existing, this is also a key element of, of Schmitter and Karl's discussion. Uh, what they emphasize is, yes, elections exist, and every four years we held our rulers accountable. We vote them into office again, or we vote them out of office if and when we don't like them anymore. Hmm? But in the interim period, we continue to hold them accountable in this public realm, in this system of governance. We hold our rulers accountable through the workings of interest associations, through the workings of social movements, through the workings of civil society. Okay, so groups or a group or different groups of people with a more or less formal or informal set of goals coming together, hmm? making decisions together, independent of the government, and they wish to articulate their interests. Okay, not only at critical junctures of election, elections, I'm sorry, but also in other periods. So elections are not enough. So competition does not take place only at elections. Competition also takes place in or within interest associations or interest associations competing against one another, interest associations competing against or objecting to ruling political parties, uh, social movements coming together, making their case against the government, or different social movements confronting one another. Okay, so competition exists throughout competition should exist in a modern political democracy. Warren, Schmitter, and Karl. Okay, so, so all of these should exist at the same time um, in order to complement 
elections. Citizens in this respect compete to influence policy making during intervals between the elections. So not only at election one, election after another, but during the intervals in between the elections. Um, so so this, is, this is very important. Um, and, and, all, and these interest associations, social movements, civil society actors, they place some aspects of governance beyond the reach of majorities. So in a way, this is a check or a balance against uh, tyranny of majority, uh, fallacy of electionism. Okay? So all of these should exist, coexist at the same time. That's, that's what they emphasize. Um, and that, that's what they, um, they take to be very important. Um, another element, another, keep, please, yes. Are there any um, pre-protectional policies of democracy uh, to protect the um, democracy itself? Mm -hmm. um, remember we talked about checks and balances, separation of powers. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about these in way much more detail. This is, I'm, I'm trying to basically go over some conceptual approaches, some conceptual elements, but we'll, we'll see um, all of these with material evidence in each of the five cases that, that we shall be discussing. But of course there are. Uh, Bill of Rights, constitutional provisions, hmm? consociationism, neocorporatist decision-making procedures. All of these are in fact elements which protect democracies. They become useless sometimes, as you can see, but uh, and uh, also uh, sometimes it doesn't mean anything. Uh, I'm asking, what are the uh, protectional uh, policies that democracy mm -hmm. uh, help us for uh, protect its? Own? So, how do democratic systems protect themselves? Yeah. Hmm? That's that's. See, see, all of these procedures, if and when. They coexist. Okay, so all of these procedures, if and when they coexist, including others that I just mentioned, as long as they exist simultaneously at the same time, these political systems are supposed to endure. Okay, but but mind you, once again, this is one approach to conceptualizing democracy. Uh, this is one version of conceptualizing democracy. This is one group of scholars, which happens to be the mainstream, uh, which happens to represent the mainstream thinking in comparative political studies. As long as these procedures exist at the same time, and all of them existing at the same time, without any exception, all of them coexisting without any exception, these systems of governance we call democracy. This is the procedural approach. Other guys are saying, hey, we don't care about them. We find them useless. Even if competition, cooperation, representative system of governance, accountability exist, they don't guarantee equality. They don't guarantee fairness. They don't bring about justice. Okay, so, um, so let me emphasize once again that there are two approaches to conceptualizing democracy. Yes, within the procedural approach, all of these should exist, coexist, but there is the other side of the debate. Scholars who argue that, hey, these are, you know, useless. We just don't care about them. What we care most is whether a system of governance guarantees those outcomes. And that's it. Regardless of these procedures, regardless of the existing of, uh, existence of these procedures. So, so, um, so in order to come back to your question once again, um, these guys are saying the procedural approach 
scholars or scholars who advocate the procedural approach, who, who conceptualize democracy from the procedural uh, approach or perspective, argue that these should exist at the same time. They all should be present. We, we should all tick all these boxes. If and when we don't, we can't tick one, we don't call that system a political democracy or mo a modern political democracy. Is that clear? That's, that's very important. So all of these have to coexist. Um, then comes cooperation. Okay. Um, yes, there should be competition as the necessary evil in a modern political democracy, but there should also be cooperation. Cooperation, uh, Schmitter and Carl argue, should exist. And citizens must cooperate in order to be able to compete. So cooperation should exist for honest and fair competition. They should be able to cooperate collectively mobilize, collectively articulate their interests, collectively express their needs in order to be able to compete against one another in um, collectivities. Okay, So um, citizens should be able to cooperate in institutions, collective institutions, such as political parties interest associations, civil society organizations, social movements, political movements. Okay, They should be able to come together, express their needs, voice, articulate their interests, and um, freely mobilize, and be able to cooperate in all of these um, institutions. Um, they should be able to make voluntarily make collective decisions, freely voluntarily make collective decisions, independent of any institution, which includes the state, of course. Okay? And citizens should also be able to deliberate among themselves within civil society, which are diverse units of social identity, social interest, once again, independent of the state. For a civil society association organization to be and remain civil, it should be independent, it should be autonomous, from the government. Okay? And um, in this way, civil society and all those forms of cooperation, including political parties, social movements, interest associations, and all those, represent intermediate levels of governance between the state and the individual. So these are intermediate levels of governance or instruments of governance between the state and the individual. And, um, and all of these are to ensure re uh, restraining the, the arbitrariness or potential arbitrariness of state uh, institutions or rulers themselves. So um, they should be able to participate in not only policy making, but also conflict resolution. Okay? So all of these should exist at the same time. And, um, and finally, representatives. Who are these representatives? These representatives in a modern political democracy are democratically chosen and they're held accountable by citizens in the public realm. 
Okay? They're democratically chosen and they're held accountable by citizens in the public realm. Um, channels of representation, Schmitter and Carl point to two major channels. One is electoral, as you can imagine, right? Elections, they help represent interests. They help articulate needs. They help voice um, different voices. Um, and they are periodically accountable. I mean, rulers, the elected officials, representatives are periodically accountable to citizens on the basis of territorial constituencies. Elections, whenever you go to the poll station, ladies and gentlemen, you remember that you reside in a district and you vote on the basis of that district. Huh? So, so constituencies are based on territoriality, geography. When you go to the polls, anyone who's ever participated in elections, either as a vote as being a voter, like casting a vote, or you know, representing themselves in the class. Anyone who's who's participated in elections here? No one? Hey, come on guys, all of you have. Or most of you have, right? So when you go to the polls, those of you who reside at the residences, whose official residence is the residences like like up here, um, you vote for Chankaya, the district of Chankaya, right? Those of you who reside elsewhere in Ankara, you vote for their own, for your own districts. Those of you, or some of you, may have to go back to their own um, cities um, of where their official residence is and vote there. So, so, um, so representatives, in terms of channels of representation, elections take place based on um, territorial constituencies. And in addition to those territorial constituencies, there is, of course, interest representation through interest associations, um, so, uh, social movements, civil society actors, um, which is a special kind of representation in addition to or as well as constitu consi um, territorial constituencies. Um, you may be representing your functional interests. You may be representing your class interests. You may be representing your ethnic interests or ethnic identities. You may be representing your, um, your, um, your religious identities. Okay, So all those should exist in a modern political democracy. So just to conclude, in a modern political democracy, all of these procedures, Schmitter and Karl and others who side with them, they should exist side by side with one another. And all of these should coexist, meaning that they should be there as a collectivity. So we cannot say, oh, in this political system, we call this modern political democracy, but cooperation is impaired. All of these should exist uh, in high quality, um, and they should, they should be enduring, they should be stable, they should be predictable within system, a regular system of governance. Any questions? I think I covered a lot in about 45 minutes. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this as we, as we continue uh, in the course, OK? So, so if, if there will be questions, um, you may be ri raising uh, when we study these five, five different cases. So we'll, we'll talk about them in more detail. Yes, please. 
an interest association. Any example of an interest association, ladies and gentlemen? Lobby representative. What else? Trade unions or labor unions. Any others? Business associations? Hmm? Any, anything else? Uh, the union of architects and engineers, huh? which have been very influential. Chambers. Chambers of commerce, chambers of industry. Hmm? Anything else? So all of these are representing sometimes functional interests, but sometimes not. So, so all of these are civil society associations representing some kind of interest or representing some kind of identity. OK? Any other questions? Please? Democracy overthrown by the democracy. Plutocracy. Um, Market their ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we again encounter an auction. Mm -hmm. uh, they design their own their future policies in accordance with the uh, demands of the founders. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and how much, how many of them, the more money came to them, mm -hmm. the more chance do they have? Of course, in the, in, in, the mm -hmm. so in the American system, in the US system. Um, in part, that's why Schmitter and Karl warn us against this agglomeration problem. Um, policy package of party A, policy package of party B. If you want to pick and choose, you, you just can't, right? There are two major political parties that come to power that alternate coming to power in the US, for example, right? And citizens are you know, felt obliged to vote for one or the other. So this is, this is one major, major problem of agglomeration, aggregation problem. OK. Yes. For example, a candidate uh, promised to the uh, citizens to uh, abolish the article, this article. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. So is this allowed in the political system? Of course it is allowed in the political system. And, and in, in, in a modern democracy, conceptualize as such. All of these interest representation should be allowed in the system. OK? Any other questions? All right, so let's take a break.